So our available evidence suggests that women will choose resources and good genes, and males will also choose the same things. And some of these choices have been shown to increase fitness, with the caveat that it's really hard to measure fitness in humans. But what does this mean for the conflict of the sexes, the classic conflict? Are girls chaste and boys promiscuous? <laughs> we used to think that the behavior that we observed, say two birds raising young together on a nest, familial harmony, was the mating system, monogamy in this case. And then we developed the genetic tools to do parentage analysis. And we found that promiscuity was rampant. And not just for the males, but for the females. The idea that females are demure little things with no taste for extracurricular activities is a myth. If it's advantageous for her to do so, she's going to mate with other males. The splendid fairy wren has been called the world's most promiscuous bird. He's quite the flashy chap. It turns out when he's off making time with another girl, she's doing the same and having extracurricular fun of her own. In fact, we knew for a long time that he was having fun, but researchers didn't know that she was too. It turns out that almost none of the eggs that the two will raise together will be his. <laughs> Many insect species are multi-mating. The queen honeybee mates only one, one physical time in her life, but she's chased by a cloud of up to 25,000 suitors. They're all vying for the opportunity to mate with her. If they manage to catch her and they get lucky, well, they're going to die at the height of ecstasy because their penis breaks off inside her and they drop dead to the ground. Once she's able to pull it out and fly again, she'll mate up to 20 more times. Jane Goodall observed a female chimp mate with eight different males 84 times over 24 hours. In some cases, biologists have shown that there's an advantage for multiple matings by females. And these range in what kind of advantage there is. Lionesses may have sex about 150 or more times when they're in heat. Without lots of vigorous sex, it's believed that they won't ovulate. This is the case in house cats. They will not ovulate if they don't have very painful, loud sex. The painful part we'll get back to later. There's things on his penis that kind of rip her up a bit. And it turns out that we, well, we think the same thing is true for lionesses, but nobody wants to get close enough to check the lion. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we see similar sorts of, um, well, actually, we see a different effect in some of the other species I'm showing you here. In sand lizards and ground squirrels and slippery dicks, that's the fish. <clears throat> Imagine Googling that to try to find a picture. <laughs> Not recommended. Mm. But in all three of those species, mating females have more offspring if they mate with multiple males than the females that only mate with one. What about humans? Of course we want to know. In humans, genetic estimates of extra pair births, offspring, not sex, births, range from 3 to 12 percent. Births. So you can imagine that extra pair mating is probably significantly higher. It gives new meaning to who's your daddy. <laughs> One of the ways we can assess promiscuous versus chaste behavior in humans is what's, what's called the socio-sexual inventory. So here's a quick quiz for you. Basically, researchers ask people about their sex lives. How many partners have you had sex with? How many different partners do you foresee having sex with? I don't know why, but you're only allowed to give a maximum of 30. <laughs> you're asked to, to rank how much you approve of this, you know, sex without love is okay. And remember, these are usually given to 20 year olds. So, you know, you might get different results if you were asking some of us here in the room. I don't know, maybe not. Um, but what, what we can do, you get a range of scores, they go from um, four to up in the 70s, and we can use that, although it's self-reported, you know, we can take it for what it is, and we can explore for different cultures the socio-sexual indices of men and women. David Schmidt did this for 48 societies from Argentina to Zimbabwe. So what did he find? Okay, first off, more female biased societies 
So relatively more women than men, kind of like that Polish study I told you about, like these in Eastern Europe, tend to have very high sociosexual indices. These would be people that rank themselves as being more promiscuous. On the other hand, male bias societies like these in Asia tend to be relatively non-promiscuous in the way that they rank themselves. This has been interpreted similar to the way that I told you the Polish data was interpreted. The idea here is that if you have a female bias society, in such cases, females can't be too choosy because they have a lower probability of netting a stay-at-home daddy. And so in these cases, there's a bit more fooling around. Now there's actually a lot of overlap between men and women in their scores for the sociosexual index, suggesting that the dichotomy of one sex being chaste and the other kind of foxy is pretty artificial. Although men do tend to score higher, Darwin would say they're more eager to mate. Um, but there are some societies where we see little difference between men and women. And where are they? Oh, I should say, there's Canada. You were all looking, eh? There's Canada. OK. Um, so what kind of societies do we see the least amount of difference between men and women in their sociosexual index? Well, one's kind of like ours. These are societies where women are more empowered. It was judged in this study by how many women are in par parliament. These would be cases then where women have earning power, so they have resources of their own, and they also have control over their reproductive output through things like birth control. The other thing that differentiates between these two here that are both high percentages of, of women power, for lack of a better way of summarizing it, has to do with birth weight. So low birth weight is pretty infrequent in Canada and in other countries that fall in this category. So that means that if you do have a child, chances are it's going to be healthy. There's another way that we can explore our mating system. And that's by thinking about other organisms. When women are promiscuous and they're mating with many different males, we find a couple of truisms. One is that males tend to produce very large amounts of sperm. So that fairy wren, eight billion in one shot. For comparison, humans, 180 million. So in, in cases where males are producing large amounts of sperm, um, you're probably all picturing some biologists out there collecting it. We actually can just measure testis size, and so I'm going to show you some data on that in a minute. It's a little bit less yucky when you think about it. <laughs> Here's the other thing we see, structures for sperm removal. This is the penis of a, of a dragonfly. And what we're seeing here is this structure magnified. Look at those spines. It's like a little scoop to pull sperm out from whoever she is already mated with. That's what this is. That's a gob of sperm. So when we see highly elaborate penises, they've often been modified for removal of sperm from the female because she's been mating with other males. Sometimes it's not that there's spines like this. Sometimes there's other things. I learned that rats actually have prehensile penises that can move around in the female's uterus and pull out the sperm in a suction action. <laughs> Fascinating, really. I want to know how they learn this stuff, don't you? <laughs> There's another way. Males can produce chastity belts, plugs, basically. They can plug up the female's reproductive tract, kind of like the penis that breaks off the honeybee male. And that can make it so that another male can't access her easily afterwards. These are really common. Snakes, worms, spiders. This is a mouse. Chimps produce them. Very close relative of ours. So one way that we can assess our relative promis promiscuity is to look for traits like this in ourselves and in our close relatives. <laughs> Primates exhibit a diversity not only of appearances, but of mating styles. And we can put them broadly into two categories. 
There are those that what are what we call multi-male. So each female is mating with multiple different males. In those cases, we might expect things like the sperm competition I told you about, where producing lots and lots of sperm means you basically have more lottery tickets and a better chance of winning. In multi-male species, we might also expect to have extravagant ways of removing another male's sperm. In unimale species, the female tends to mate with just a single male. This doesn't mean that these species are chaste. Um, you can have females mating, though, only with one male because he's got a harem of, of females that he's protecting. Think of the gorilla. In such cases, his equipment doesn't need to be so big. And you can also see monogamy. That would also be another unimale system.